I'd like to acknowledge the owners of the land on which we stand, wherever we come from, our elders past and present. I'd also like to acknowledge the wisdom and light keepers, the people who've kept these medicines alive and with us as human civilization from the very beginning. And if it were not for them, we wouldn't be here and we wouldn't be having this conversation about healing the immense suffering that's taking place in so many parts of the world and some of which is avoidable. So we're gonna just start off with a very short introductory video about Mind Medicine Australia and um, a little bit about who we are and why we exist. And uh, then I'll introduce Robin and welcome Robin. Thank you. Did you know that over 45% of Australians will experience mental illness in their lifetime? That's nearly half of us. I can't sleep. I don't. Everything feels flat and grey. I feel ashamed. Mental ill health devastates lives and families and costs Australians around $60 billion a year. Research and treatment expenses continue to rise, yet rates of mental illness indicate that we're losing the battle. New approaches are urgently needed to address this immense suffering and cost. Psychedelic assisted psychotherapy is currently being trialled worldwide and has demonstrated remarkable promise in treating depression, anxiety, addiction and post-traumatic stress disorder with new trials underway for treatment of dementia and anorexia. The treatment combines a short program of psychotherapy with just a few medicinal doses of psilocybin or MDMA. In the 1950s and 60s, psychedelic treatments had a major impact in psychiatry, and many considered it the next big thing in mental health treatment. But for political reasons, the Nixon administration criminalised the use of psychedelics and effectively stopped all research. That research has finally begun again. With proper clinical support, psychedelic treatments are safe and frequently lead to remission after only a short program and even where current treatments have failed. Here at Mind Medicine Australia, we believe everyone should have access to the best treatments for mental illness. Subject to forthcoming clinical trial results, we will seek to establish best practice in regulated psychedelic-assisted treatment. Mind Medicine Australia is wholly focused on the clinical application of psychedelic medicines. We're preparing for change by developing therapist training, ethical guidelines, a centre of excellence in psychedelic medicine, educational material and events, and supporting clinical research. We're a small organisation doing big things, and we need your support. Please share this video and visit our website to support us and get involved. Excellent. So we're now going to show just a couple of short slides about Mind Medicine Australia and who we are. So um, we'll put those on now. And we started Mind Medicine Australia two years ago. My husband and I, Peter Hunt, and he'll be on this call shortly. This webinar is entitled Psilocybin versus SSRIs? Question mark. A cure for depression. Next slide. Thank you. And uh, just a reminder to all of you out there, we do not encourage or facilitate illegal use of psychedelics or plant medicines. Our focus is wholly clinical. We are recording this webinar and we will share it on our YouTube channel um, in due course. Next slide. Thank you. And next one. So here we are with this major mental health crisis, now at alarming levels and getting worse. These figures are pre-COVID. One in five Australian adults had a chronic mental health, mental illness. One in eight Australians were on antidepressants, including one in four older Australians, one in 30 children on antidepressants as young as four years of age. So these figures have exacerbated significantly during the COVID crisis and also a bushfire crisis. And it's estimated that one in two of us will experience a mental illness in our lifetime. So if it's not me, it's you, 
We're all in this together and this is personal for every single one of us. Next slide. So unfortunately, there's been no improvement in treatment outcomes over the past 50 years. So only an estimated 30 to 35% of sufferers experience remission from pharmacotherapy, primarily antidepressants or psychotherapy. Often there's relapse um, after treatment stops for those that do have some response and the side effects are significant for many people and, and quite well known. In the case of post-traumatic stress disorder, remission rates are as low as 5%. So the majority of patients are not actually going into remission and are not able to lead fully meaningful and satisfying and happy lives. And therefore, a more of the same approach is not going to solve the problem, which is why we're here with Mind Medicine Australia and here today. Next slide, thank you. So Mind Medicine Australia is a charity which helps to alleviate the suffering caused by mental illness through expanding the treatment options available to medical practitioners and their patients. Peter and I are both philanthropists. We donate our time and money and uh, our passion uh, to, this, to this very important mission. Our focus at the moment is on medicinal psilocybin for the treatment of depression and medicinal MDMA for the treatment of PTSD. But we are also interested in studies and other psychedelic medicines around, including ketamine, ibogaine, DMT, ayahuasca, and so on. For us, success means that these therapies become an integral part of our mental health system. That means that if you go to the doctor, they are given to you as a first line treatment option with full disclosure on risks and benefits of each option, that they continue to achieve the high remission rates that they've been achieving in trials and that they're accessible and affordable to all Australians in need, no matter where they're based um, or their background. Next slide. So the remarkable thing about these medicines is that they only require two to three medicinal sessions in combination with a short course of psychotherapy in contrast to conventional treatments where Patients often have to take medications for decades or sometimes their whole lives, um, go to therapy potentially for their whole lives. And for many patients, mental illness feels like a life sentence. And the remarkable thing about these treatments is that in many cases, they are actually curative. They're not palliative. They're not just managing the condition. They're considered very safe in medically controlled environments and non-addictive. And I'm sure Robin will talk further about that. Both medicines have been granted breakthrough therapy designation by the FDA in the US, which is a designation that's given only rarely and only to medicines that could be vastly superior to existing treatments to fast track the approval process. Next slide. So Robin, I'm gonna let you um, explain these two circles because I would feel really like, I love talking about these, these circles and what actually happens in the brain. And you're probably gonna talk about this, but maybe you'll talk more about the study, but do you mind just explaining to everyone what's happening here? What's happening to the brain on psilocybin? Sure, so we're looking at uh, <laughs> functional connectivity in these images. So these aren't actually new fiber tracts. Sometimes people um, uh, misunderstand that. So we're looking at how different regions in the brain represented by the dots on the periphery of the circle uh, are talking to each other and how strength, how strong that communication is. The different colors are different communities of regions. You might think of the yellow as being the visual system, for example, in different regions within it, speaking to other regions within the visual system. And what you see under psilocybin on the left there is that there's much more uh, inter-regional, inter-community, inter-network communication going on uh, under the psilocybin. This is something we've seen with other psychedelics as well. And it's fascinating, isn't it, that there's the same amount of lines in both of those circles. Is that right? It is actually, yeah. You can't see the, the lines going from dot to dot in, in placebo, but there's actually the same number of lines but it's just the, the nature of the communication is much more open uh, under psilocybin. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you know, you, I think you're one of those wonderful scientists that, that talks about resetting and rebooting the brain in, in some of your talks. And 
how these medicines which bypass the default mode network are allowing patients to be able to break out of their typical rigid, fairly fixed structures of thinking and, and behaving. Mm. That's right. <laughs> A lot to say. A lot to yeah. say. Excellent. Next slide, Ilan. So MMA's four key strategic areas in building the ecosystem for these medicines to be available awareness and knowledge building. So education and events like these. So this free webinar series, but we really encourage you, if you enjoyed this webinar, and we hope you will, that you will make donations and support the enormous mission that we have to make these medicines available and accessible to those who need them. We have a major international medical summit in November, which Robin and many other leading researchers and psychiatrists and doctors in this space will be attending and presenting at. We also focus on funding relevant, particularly novel research, and we've started state and regional and rural chapters all around Australia and New Zealand to really educate and build awareness locally and build a movement of people from around the place, really, who can make sure that we focus on data and science and don't get caught up in baggage and stigma of the past. Secondly, we've started the first ever certificate in psychedelic assisted therapies in the Southern Hemisphere. That commenced in January. Many of the students in that course are uh, uh, on this webinar and we, we salute them. They are the pioneers, um, psychiatrists, psychologists, GPs, psychotherapists, mental health nurses, social workers, occupational therapists. Thank you so much uh, for being leading visionaries and medical practitioners who are really forging the way to make sure that we can actually uh, have a pipeline of therapists who will be available to treat patients and, and who already are available to treat patients through the special access scheme. And um, we'll talk further about that as well. And we're also looking at developing the very first Asia Pacific Centre for Emerging Mental Health Therapies in partnership with one or two wonderful universities for advanced um, research and development. So applied research and development uh, development of supply chains and agribusiness so that we can actually develop an industry for these medicines in Australia, manufacturing, rollout of clinics, economic analysis, and so on. And finally, as many of you will know, um, we've been looking at the legal and ethical frameworks. We've applied to the TGA for the rescheduling of both psilocybin and MDMA from Schedule 9, which is prohibited, to Schedule 8 controlled medicine. And uh, I'm sure that Robin will explain why psilocybin deserves to at least be a controlled medicine. We also have a psychological support service for those people that are using these medicines and need further support and integration support. And we also have a number of approvals occurring at the moment through the special access scheme of the TGA where psychiatrists and prescribing doctors are gaining approvals for patients who are treatment resistant on a case by case basis to treat them with either psilocybin or MDMA assisted therapies, which is very exciting. We have some state barriers still in place, but we are working hard to ensure that those patients who are suffering deeply get access to these medicines as soon as possible. Next slide, Ilan. So yes, whilst our webinars are free of charge, we do really um, ask you to do whatever you can to support this mission in terms of making a donation. We also have opportunities to join our chapter and chapters all around Australia, become volunteers and help in any way you can by spreading the word and making sure that we educate everyone just how important it is that we innovate in treatment of mental illness at this critical time. So with that, I think now we're going to introduce Robin and hand over the screen to you, Robin. And I just wanna say that um, Peter and I have been very fortunate to spend a lot of time with Robin. Um, and he's not only an incredible scientist who's dedicated his career to advancing this very, very important 
um, area of medicine and, and treatment of people suffering with mental illness, but he's also just an incredible human being. And um, he's, of course, been um, head of the Centre for Psychedelic Research at Imperial College now, which has done incredible work. And he'll talk a little bit about that, I'm sure. And he's got some amazing title, which I've got to read, Psychedelics, Brain and Behavioural Mechanisms as well. <laughs> and I'm sure he'll tell you a little more about his, his forward plans, but he is on the advisory panel of Mind Medicine Australia. We're very proud to have him um, as part of our incredible team of international leaders. And we're looking forward, Robin, to having you in Australia over the coming months as, as well for the Global Summit. So over to you, big round of applause to Robin. Woohoo! <laughs> Thank you, Tanya. Thank you to uh, everyone at Mind Medicine Australia, and thanks everyone for, for tuning in. Um, very pleased to be with you. Good evening. <laughs> um, okay, so what I have with this presentation is uh, a multi-level approach to this question of uh, how does psychedelic drugs, classic psychedelics, affect the brain and the mind? And I, I think this is a key question for uh, understanding the therapeutic potential of psychedelics and putting it in a context and, and understanding it in a way that sort of, you know, enriches uh, uh, our understanding. So I begin at the uh, lowest, I think, functionally meaningful level, the molecular level, and this question of where does it all begin? Where do these molecules these classic psychedelic compounds first have uh, uh, some meaningful action. And there the answer is that there's a certain aspect of the serotonin system, one of the most complex, if not the most complex neuromodulatory system in our brains with at least 14 different receptor subtypes that when stimulated by serotonin itself or a drug, uh, the effects of uh, signaling at the different receptors can be quite different from each other. So a range of different functions are engaged or activated by stimulating serotonin receptors. And we know that one is critically important to the action of psychedelics. It's this serotonin 2A receptor. We can look at this nice PET image, which addresses where they are in the brain, very much cortical receptors, but more important than that, um, perhaps is that the distribution isn't entirely even throughout the brain. There's more expression in what we call high-level cortex or transmodal cortex than uh, anywhere else. And you'll discover as we go through that this is particularly important and interesting to understand uh, the, the action of these compounds. So we know that the 2A receptor is really important because it was discovered first in the uh, mid 1980s that there's a tight correlation between the affinity or the binding potential, the stickiness, if you want, of a given psychedelic compound for this particular receptor and that compound's potency. So whether looking in animals or in uh, humans, uh, there is this relationship between the um, the active dose required and the affinity. So for example, LSD, very high affinity for the serotonin to A receptor and incredibly potent psychoactive in doses down to like 12 to 15 micrograms. So there's a thousand of those in a milligram. So that gives some context. And you compare that to another psychedelic, mescaline, the compound that Aldous Huxley took famously when he wrote the the doors of perception about his experience with mescaline. He took 400 milligrams of mescaline and mescaline has a much lower affinity for the 2A receptors. We still think that 2A signaling is key to its action, but uh, less potent at that receptor. We also know that this um, receptor is so important because if you give a what we call an antagonist or a blocker of it before you give a psychedelic, then you don't trip, so to speak. You don't have a, a psychedelic experience anywhere near the, the sort of typical intensity and generally speaking, you know, dose dependently, but you, you would abolish all of the signature psychological and behavioral effects of a psychedelic if you pre-treat with a 2A 
receptor blocker or antagonist. And now we have this nice recent data from the same team that produced this uh, very nice uh, PET image, more PET work here, looking at displacement of um, the uh, radioactively labeled uh, uh, ligand that sticks to the 2A receptor. You give different doses of psilocybin and you displace uh, that, that what we call hot ligand. And then you can look at the percentage occupancy of the 2A receptors by given dosages of psilocybin in this case. And here up around 60% plus uh, 20 milligrams of psilocybin and above, I think were being given um, and it was this dose range that produced um, quite marked subjective effects. And this is useful to know, given that a lot of the therapeutic work that's occurring uh, today and in recent years is using 25 milligrams as, as a stock um, flat dose of psilocybin. So with that context set, we know the 2A receptor is important. So then we ask the question, what does it do? What's it for if you want? And there, the picture that's emerging uh, from a number of different angles, converging evidence is, is saying that increases in plasticity uh, are key um, here, a uh, key property of 2A signaling. The plasticity can be broadly defined as the ability to, for a system to be molded or, or changed. Um, and one can imagine if you increase plasticity, then you might change, you might adapt to one's environmental conditions. So that's what we're looking at here. And often we think of, at least in cognitive neuroscience or neuroscience generally, we think of plasticity as almost being synony synonymous with neuroplasticity. So the ability of the brain to change. And there we've looked at that, uh, different researchers have looked at markers of neuroplasticity uh, with the administration of psychedelics and have found uh, marked increases in, in different markers of neuroplasticity. So a, a doubling of a certain marker in the cortex. Remember, that's where you find these receptors most densely expressed. So doubling in the cortex of something called BDNF, a neuroplasticity marker. And then this more recent work looking at synaptogenesis, so growth of different uh, components of the... Um, anatomy that's involved in the communication between brain cells, uh, the neurons. Also a lot of evidence to link the serotonin system itself, but particularly the 2A receptor to brain development, a very exciting finding published in a leading uh, journal just last year, a Neuron, that links uh, 2A signaling, uh, that key receptor that psychedelics work on, linking that receptor to cortical expansion and uh, in uh, fetal uh, brains of different species, it was found that the proliferation of what we call basal progenitor cells, these are sort of neural stem cells, pre-neurons if you want, what sets our brains apart from other animals is the sheer number of neurons in our cortex especially. Uh, and the proliferation of these pre-neurons, these basal progenitors is required for the cortical expansion that sets our species apart. It's a really exciting finding there um, and, and you know, triggers a lot of interesting questions about the role of the serotonin 2A receptor, that key receptor that psychedelics work on in the evolution of the human brain itself. We can also look at a range of different uh, examples of learning, low level learning, associative, low level associative learning, um, uh, particularly air puffs in, in rabbits here with LSD, there's an acceleration of the learning process with uh, a certain dosage of LSD. And then if you block the 2A receptor, uh, then you'll slow down the learning process. Also unlearning or extinction learning, the kind of thing that you would want to engage if you want to change some psychopathology, you know, an addiction, for example, you would want to unlearn those uh, um, habits. And so that's been found to be uh, increased through exposure to psychedelics. We can also look at cognitive flexibility, the ability to change one's behavior, given some information feedback, and also psychological flexibility, the ability to sit with difficult emotions, feeling states, difficult memories, sit with and work through, rather than, for example, seeking some kind of defensive 
uh, um, uh, avoidance strategy. Um, so again, with a, a context set of 2A receptors being particularly important, and then they're linked to plasticity, an interesting question is, when does this system especially engage? So psychedelics are drugs that hijack a natural system that's evolved presumably for some um, uh, ad advantageous function. So what might that be? And there, uh, delving into this question of what engages this system, you'll find that a background of chronic stress particularly primes this system. It increases the availability of 2A, 2A receptors. It makes uh, animals more sensitive to a, a 2A uh, agonist. Here, looking at, at a certain behavioral readout of 2A stimulation in animals that have undergone a background of chronic stress. And similarly here, looking at expression of a certain plasticity gene. Uh, yep. Oops, I'm on mute, I think. Uh, activated by 2A signaling. Um, listening to a webinar. Yeah, you might want to mute yeah. your, your mic there if that's right. I can come out for a second. Uh, maternal uh, separation and chronic immobilization stress has uh, increased, markedly increased sensitivity to 2A signaling there. And so if that's the background for priming the 2A system, how do you engage it? Well, you have to release the endogenous ligand, uh, the natural chemical itself that is, you know, what these receptors exist for, you might say, and that's serotonin, of course. And so acute stress is seemingly probably the most reliable way outside of drugs to release serotonin. And there are a range of different acute stresses, tail pinch, handling, swim stress, will release, markedly release serotonin onto this prime system if there's a background of chronic stress. So what's all this about? Why am I presenting this? Well, it, again, it's about contextualizing the system. Why do we have it? Why is it evolved? Yes, psychedelics are interesting, fascinating drugs that hijack the system and engage plasticity. But this is the natural system. This is why it's developed, presumably as a system that can uh, engage during particular adaptive pressures, adversity, difficult times requiring the ability to be adaptive, to be plastic, to, uh, and, and you can see why that would confer functional advantages. So a lot of that work is reviewed in this paper, Pivotal Mental States, that I um, published uh, last year with the uh, American students, Harry Brower. Um, and uh, the definition of these states are transient hyperplastic states uh, that are exceptionally sensitive to the environmental conditions that they occur in, which then depends whether one pivots towards wellness or improved mental health outcomes or pivots towards uh, uh, psychopathology or mental illness. And so in a sense, these states are outcome agnostic they're just states in which there is an exceptional ability to change. And when we do psychedelic therapy, of course, we're trying to harness this, this golden opportunity to pivot people out of psychopathology and towards wellness. You could imagine these states occurring in a context of a background of chronic stress and then overlaid with acute stress. And you might think, oh, maybe some of these mechanisms engage when one actually pivots towards psychopathology or mental illness. So again, I think it's useful to set that context and it tees us up for looking at the modern evidence uh, on psychedelics. And there are some important uh, take home points to emphasize. One is that all of these studies, to my knowledge across the board, and there's quite a few now, have manipulated the context in a favorable way. I think across the board, they've all had patients or participants listening to music. We call that the hidden therapist uh, because there's a, an assumption that it's, uh, while we might describe the therapeutic model as being non-directive, there is this sort of implicit uh, and sometimes explicit, you know, direction that's being provided by music. Um, and so that's important to emphasize. Also, all of these sessions have been guided, usually by two actually, um, what we call guides or therapists. Uh, and um, occasionally uh, as we're going forward, some studies are looking at just one uh, therapist. Um, 
The other important take home messages are the rapid onset of improvements in symptom severity here from our first depression trial, you can see a lot of people going into remission after the first week, about half of them, close to half. Um, and uh, um, everyone showing some degree of decrease in depressive symptoms. There's a lot of variability beyond that and some relapse as we go out to three and six months. Um, and so part of the uh, quest going forwards is to try and understand how to uh, minimize relapse um, and understand the question, you know, why doesn't this work for everyone? Um, and so a lot of, uh, um, you know, busy thinking going in that direction. Also the enduring improvements, you know, you compare this treatment and the outcomes to something like ketamine infusion, where a lot of excitement has, has um, occurred around the rapid onset of antidepressant effects. Um, but repeat administration is typically required and, and the effects don't really seem to be you know, that well sustained. And then if you're repeating administration with a compound like ketamine, there's some toxicity issues and maybe even dependency issues uh, to think about. You don't really have those issues with psychedelics. They don't have any uh, known, um, uh, certainly any known neurotoxicity or any uh, appreciable toxicity to major organs, uh, minimal, if not non-existent addiction potential. These aren't drugs that animals self-administer. If anything, they seem to be actually fundamentally aversive. Animals will avoid uh, taking a psychedelic. Humans don't take them in, in a kind of Moorish way that you associate with other drugs of abuse like uh, alcohol, for example. Um, so uh, yes, uh, and another important take home point is a lot of different indications of being um, assessed with positive findings. So is there a transdiagnostic action to psychedelic therapy? And if there is, what is it? And so what I'm proposing is that there is a common space and we might define it as maladaptive habits of mind and or behavior. And what psychedelic therapy does is to come in and relax those heavily weighted, heavily entrenched, uh, strongly learnt um, maladaptive patterns of thinking and behaving. And that's a window of opportunity for the healthy revision of these um, behaviors and ways of thinking. So that's a model, um, we'll come back to it. Um, but in the meantime, let's address the acute action of psychedelics. Tanya showed this image of psilocybin increasing between community communication. We've seen a similar thing with LSD, eyes closed scanning, uh, this um, increase in communication to the primary visual cortex correlated with uh, participants' ratings of the uh, vividness of complex imagery, dreamlike imagery that they were experiencing under the LSD. We can look at DMT and find a similar effect increase in global functional connectivity. And we can drill down a little bit and look at the dynamics that contribute to this um, uh, finding. And uh, here we're looking at a number of different brain states is the best way to think of it. These eight states at the top, there's no real meaning to the sequence that they're in. They're just showing you the, the different states, attractors, if you understand what that means, that the brain can sort of gravitate into uh, it, within a given scanning period. And what we find under DMT, and we find this with psilocybin and LSD as well, is that the brain skips over these high level uh, transmodal states, the states like the default mode network, but not limited to it. Um, but these are uh, regions, um, networks that have the densest expression of the 2A receptor. So what's happening is that the 2A receptor is coming in, it's dysregulating activity, particularly in these systems, and it kind of scrambles these systems. They sort of disappear or they lose their boundaries. And instead you get a more globally coherent brain state coming into prominence. And it's a little counterintuitive that there's no color in here, really we should be coloring in the cortex because this is a globally coherent brain state that dominates the picture under psychedelics. So a more globally interconnected brain and you get a dissolution, temporary dissolution of these high level 
uh, um, networks. So this is pushing the narrative on a little bit from an earlier one that focused very much on the default mode network. Here we see a particular circuit within the default mode network, a certain system that's interesting for a few reasons, uh, very uh, metabolically hungry, densely interconnected. Um, yeah, hierarchically, if we look at its properties, seems to sit at the top end of a functional hierarchy in the brain. And we see, yes, we see this network break down under psychedelics and that correlates with ego dissolution, ratings of ego dissolution. But I would say that where we are right now is, is more thinking of these dynamics and the rule is more that it's sort of DMN plus that temporarily breaks down under psychedelics. This is uh, one of my favorite slides at the moment because there's a lot of information in there but some quite exciting information. So we're reminded of where the 2A receptor is in the brain, where it all begins with psychedelics, the receptors that are stimulated by these classic psychedelic compounds. And then here, this is uh, uh, anatomical uh, imaging, looking at macaque brains, macaque monkey to human and plotting those regions that have undergone the largest evolutionary expansion in our species. Some of these regions are at least tenfold, I think, larger in humans than our nearest primate relatives. And it's not just, you know, there's that old kind of popular myth, I would say, about it's all about the PFC, the prefrontal cortex. It's not. It's this distributed system that includes parietal and temporal regions as well that have undergone uh, the, the most expansion in humans. And then going on, we're just looking at other properties of the brain, both functional here, looking at functional connectivity gradients that separate high level transmodal cortex from lower level, you know, the motor strip here and the visual cortex at the back. We can look at the length of fibers and longer fibers are found within this human system, you might say. We can look at uh, the variability between people. And this is a more you know, variable plastic um, rangeful system uh, between individuals than uh, those regions that are more, you know, focused and specific in their functioning. We can look at a certain kind of fast metabolism being um, uh, more um, uh, apparent in the human system. We can look at lighter myelination. So the tracts within this human system are less kind of stamped in. It's a, again, a more malleable system we can look at the processing of more abstract information occurring within this human system. Perhaps, broadly speaking, you know, the property of our mind and behavior that sets us apart from other species, the ability, I'll say this glibly, to be kind of mindless rather than mindful, to daydream, to imagine. Uh, and so, you know, such things were required to start manipulating tools. Or oh, what if I did this? And, you know, um, and then language, of course. Um, and we can look at uh, the processing of different temporal windows, longer windows being processed by the human system. DMT, expanding connectivity, particularly in this system. But you know, because I've shown you about the dynamics, that it's more about the system dissolving into the rest of the brain temporarily and becoming less moduli, less modular, less segregated from the rest of the brain. And then we can look at development, not um, evolutionarily, but developmentally through uh, birth to adulthood. And again, the expansion is most um, prominent in the same human system. So we have this very advanced aspect to our cortex that, that sets us apart from other animals. And that actually breaks down temporarily under the psychedelic. Of course, that throws up all these interesting questions of what advantage, is that an advantage? Again, I would come back to being somewhat agnostic about that. It depends. It depends on what you do with that window of exceptional plasticity. Um, and of course, in psychedelic therapy, you want to provide the most supportive, therapeutically, uh, you know, uh, conducive um, uh, conditions for, for positive outcomes. So I'm just going to work towards um, the uh, piece de resistance, the uh, psilocybin versus SSRI trial and, and some results there. But just before I do, a little bit more on models of how psychedelics work. 
this one I call Rebus, which is uh, phonetically correct at, at least, and I think people can remember it. It, it is borrowing from an arguably leading model of how the mind and brain works. Um, again, put somewhat glibly, uh, hierarchical predictive processing, which uh, essentially says that our brains develop uh, within our lifetime and evolutionarily to become models of the environment that we inhabit. Um, and, uh, and these uh, models allow us to be efficient in our functioning, to cut corners, you might say, and have sort of broad hypotheses. These are predictive models. Um, the brain is predicting the environment that it exists in. And that predictive process develops and optimizes and finesses uh, through experience. That's hierarchical predictive processing. The hierarchy bit is just that the brain is organized hierarchically and the higher levels impose their predictions on lower levels and try and explain the activity of those lower levels. Um, and we can look at images like this and probably some of you are hallucinating some motion there. And that's just a kind of cute reminder of how we experience the world through these models. And again, with this script that we can read this, yet the details are jumbled up, but because we can have efficient processing through these predictive mechanisms, we can read it. So there we go. It's, it's a model that I think is then useful to throw psychedelics at, so to speak. And an important question is how is how are these predictive processes encoded in brain activity. And they're a promising candidate. There's a number of candidates, but one uh, uh, candidate um, correlate of uh, predictive processing are these traveling waves uh, that you can record here with EEG. Um, and it's been done in a very simple way, just looking at sensors across the, uh, the top of the cortex from the front, the top end of the hierarchy to the back, the occipital cortex, where it's presumed that's lower hierarchically for a few good reasons. Um, and then the rule is that with eyes closed, the direction of the traveling waves is top down. It's from the front to the back. And that likely has some inhibitory function, some suppressive uh, function, suppressing out information, nothing to see here. I have my eyes closed. You open your eyes and you're hit with all this photic information and now the processing flows, it flips, it goes bottom up because there's stuff to process. Uh, and you see that very clearly and that's been shown empirically and also with modeling that these mechanisms uh, relate to predictive um, um, processing. And so within this context, we thought, well, what would psychedelics do and we looked at our DMT data where we in, inject in a bolus of DMT the effects are very rapid and we do this with eyes closed the participants have their eyes closed and uh, we see a flipping we see a flipping of the traveling waves just like you do with going from eyes closed to eyes open so you can see that here it uh, um, paralleled the trajectory, the dynamics of the subjective effects of DMT very tightly. Um, so very strong endorsement for the prior hypothesis that, that we had. So that's one empirical um, bit of evidence in support of the model. You can look at the phenomenology and find a lot of intuitive appeal, whether it's this phenomenon of ego dissolution. And again, we can think of this human system as being a, a you know, intriguing potential candidate for the encoding of ego functions um, and how that's temporarily broken down under psychedelics. And then as one function is lost, that top-down directive uh, executive functioning, um, what is gained if you want or what, what is allowed to express. And then you can look at the phenomenology and the very rich and complex uh, imagery that can emerge under psychedelics uh, and the emotion that can be released and memories that can be sort of, you know, um, stimulated and then percolate up into conscious awareness. So it very much fits the phenomenology. This is just another example of how we can look at hierarchical organization in the brain, looking at um, a principal gradient or spectrum 
um, of the functional connectivity that divides the top end, the transmodal cortex, the human system from the lower level unimodal cortex that does more specific things. And we see that there's a flattening of that gradient, flattening of that hierarchy under psychedelics. Um, so I promised I would address this. And you know it was uh, given prominence in the title <clears throat> and this question, and it should be a question, of course, a cure for depression, psilocybin. I had to look up, uh, uh, you know, what's a sort of consensual definition of cure, and it should be a, a, a recovery uh, um, of, uh, yeah, wellness um, uh, with a, a given intervention. And, and so there, I think probably the, the, the way that we would look at that are remission rates. First of all, let me take you through the design before I tell you the, the relative remission rates that we saw with these two treatments. It was a two arm trial, double blind, randomized control trial, two arms, you either um, went into the psilocybin condition, um, which involved two 25 milligrams, so high dose psilocybin sessions, three weeks apart with um, uh, parallel psychotherapy alongside, we call it psychological support. Um, and in addition to this, um, people took uh, placebo, inert placebo capsules every day for six weeks. And the, the trial duration was uh, six weeks, um, six weeks of capsule ingestion every day and two treatment sessions in the psilocybin arm with 25 milligrams. So what about the blue corner, the escitalopram arm? That was two dosing sessions with a very low dose of psilocybin, one milligram, presumed inactive. Why do we do that? Why don't we just give placebo? Because it allowed us to standardize expectations by saying everyone will receive psilocybin. It just transpired that if you're in the escitalopram arm, as we call it, you received a very low dose and, and presumably inactive. We have a bit of evidence to support that assumption. So what about the escitalopram? Well, instead of daily placebo capsules for six weeks, it was daily escitalopram capsules for six weeks, going up to um, 20 milligrams, the recommended maximal dosage of escitalopram for the final three weeks, 10 milligrams first, followed by 20 for the final three weeks. And that's considered sort of standard practice with escitalopram. So that was the design and the main results, we could look at those remission rates. Um, so remission is defined as being essentially absent of, of depressive symptoms, you wouldn't meet criteria for having major depressive disorder um, <clears throat> if, you, uh, if your scores on the relevant uh, measure uh, fell into this range. And there we saw uh, twice as high remission rates with psilocybin therapy, 60% versus 30. And response rates were, um, responses defined as a halving of baseline depression scores. That was, uh, um, 50% in the escitalopram condition is generally what one would expect from an SSRI treatment um, and 70% in the psilocybin arm. Uh, there was 59 patients in this trial, 30 in the psilocybin arm, 29 in escitalopram. The primary outcome measure uh, didn't quite um, reach statistical significance in favor of psilocybin. It was reductions in or changes in what we call a quick inventory of depressive symptoms, self-rated 16 item scale, which is very faithful to the, to the standard psychiatric diagnostic criteria for major depressive disorder, the DSM criteria. Um, uh, fewer degrees of freedom than some other older measures like the BDI, the Bex Depression Inventory and Hamdi and Madras as well. They all favored psilocybin, but kind of sods law in a way, it depends how you look at it. Um, uh, that uh, the one that we named, where we stuck our flag in the sand ahead of the trial and pre-registered, this is our primary outcome, didn't quite um, significantly favor psilocybin. It, there were bigger drops, um, minus eight points on the quids for psilocybin, and I think minus six or thereabouts with s but not quite a, a p-value that was statistically significant. That'll give a lot of prominence when this paper is published, it's about uh, three weeks away, we think, from going into the New England Journal of Medicine. So it's gonna make quite a splash. Uh, that's a sort of narrative that, that I think the journal wants to, 
uh, dominate things, I would say to readers of this paper, just look at the data, you know, go beyond narratives in a sense. Uh, the safety, the side effect profile, in terms of rates of adverse events was very consistent across the two conditions, but different in nature. Um, you have the classic ones of things like sexual dysfunction and uh, emotional blunting, some nausea with escitalopram. With uh, psilocybin, it was headaches the next day that were quite common. Um, so different in nature, similar in rates. If anything, some suggestions are favoring psilocybin in terms of adverse events. We also drill down into some of the things that scare people about psychedelics. Like, did we trigger any kind of psychotic symptomatology? So we didn't just leave that to spontaneous report. We actually asked about it and found no evidence of anything like that, only drops in, in for example, um, uh, any kind of manic symptoms. They just decreased uh, after psilocybin um, and no cases of what's referred to as hallucinogen persisting perceptual disorder in any of the, the patients in this trial. Um, so promising, I think, is the, the final point. And cure for depression, well, of course it depends, and, uh, it, but a lot of promise. And I do think what happens now is it moves the needle along, it moves the public sort of discourse along and people can look at there being hope uh, when they suffer from you know, these uh, very prevalent and disabling conditions like depression. There are options, there'll be op more options in the future and some options may even work better than the current treatments that we have. So I'll close it there, look forward to your questions and thank you very much for listening. Thank you so much, Robin. Can you hear me again? Um, yes. Excellent. Um, so we'll just, um, Ilan, if you could pop me on the speaker again, and so then I can start going through the questions and we'll open up the chat screen as well. Robin, I will start with um, a few questions uh, that have been asked here. Um, he's a, a big fan of your work. And generally I look at the current scientific research into psychedelics. Um, I wanted to read up on the best criticism against the use of psychedelics in therapy or against the current state. Uh, hang on one sec, so I just can't read the rest of that question, sorry. Or against the current state of the science. Hmm. Okay. Yes, um, the best criticism. I don't know, I, I think, um, a good friend of mine, Suresh uh, Kumaraswamy, uh, he's, at, uh, he's in New Zealand now, um, has written something on, um, on suggestibility and the role of suggestibility and also bias, um, uh, implicit biases that might be there in participants and uh, investigators. I think that's a, a worthwhile angle um, to look at. Uh, um, I think, you know, we very likely have a um, selective sample here of people who, you know, wanted to receive psilocybin more than the SSRI. And so there's a bias there to consider, uh, you know, psychedelic research has been my career. So you could consider implicit biases in, in terms of the researchers as well. Um, and suggestibility is likely to be a major part of the therapeutic vehicle. The key question I think going forwards is, is that a problem, uh, you know, positive expectation, suggestibility, these two things working hand in hand are components of every therapeutic intervention for mental illness, whether it's psychotherapy or SSRIs. Um, and so, you know, one um, you know, paradigm shift, you might say, is to see that as part of the therapeutic model and, and a part that could be harnessed and exploited for positive therapeutic outcomes. And if people are getting well through such means, then that's great. I, I would put in a little qualifier that I don't believe that all of the effects are dependent on suggestibility or positive expectation. I think it's a large component, but I think there's something 
deeper, more revelatory, more sort of in the domain of uh, self-understanding um, that is keeping people well after successful psychedelic therapy. I think if it was just suggestibility, then I don't think that would explain the long-term positive outcomes that you see with psychedelic therapy. There are questions, lots of questions coming in on, you know, how long do remissions last and all that sort of thing, um, which I will come to next. But I just um, had a question here. So we have to stop that. The dog is uh, is uh, enjoying his toy too much at some moment. Um, so in Australia, Mind Medicine Australia has applied to have psilocybin used as part of psychotherapy in medically controlled environments, as you know, rescheduled from Schedule 9 to Schedule 8, as I mentioned earlier. The critical tests are whether the therapy has established therapeutic value and safety. Can you comment, please, on the therapeutic value and safety? Yeah, I mean, uh, uh... I believe that there's compelling evidence now for the efficacy and um, tolerability, safety of, of psychedelic therapy. Regulators will want to see multi-site trials, certain numbers. They have certain criteria that they'll want to see met. You know, medicine uh, regulators, the FDA, and such like. Um, uh, but as a scientist, you know, in in immersed in this field the evidence looks very compelling. And so uh, to say, for example, to categorize these as compounds that have no recognized medicinal values is wrong. That, that's in contrast with the scientific evidence. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, there's this very interesting polarization that's always existed with psychedelics. Um, I think what we're on the cusp of is, is going, you know, it's such a dramatic shift to seeing these compounds not as, you know, especially, especially the way they're categorized, especially harmful uh, drugs of um, potential misuse. And then the pivot is towards seeing them as, you know, um, the future of psychiatry in a sense. I mean, it's a dramatic pivot, but I, you know, that's the direction that we're going in. But the, the important thing to emphasize is that this is, evidence for these as medicines in a particular delivered in a particular way and that's chalk and cheese to thinking of them as drugs oh. that could be used by people you know in the wild so to speak that's not well, that's what, right and yeah and that's why you know having an established therapeutic value in a medically controlled environment is such a critical you know point to make and um we're not talking about recreational use obviously so uh, and <laughs> bit of a misnomer as well i don't think people take psychedelics or if they do they sort of made a, a major error but they don't take them for fun it's more about sort of self understanding and development and mm. if they try to take these drugs for fun or for some kind of hedonic reward or uh, then they get a rude awakening because uh, that's not the effects that they produce yeah so there's, there's tons of questions here. So I'm going to ask quick questions, quick answers, Robin, and then we'll probably get through stacks of them. So there's a question here. Are there statistics on how long the remission period is when treated with, with psilocybin? Yeah, uh, it's variable, but um, depends what studies you look at. But uh, if we think about remission in particular, I would say we're, we're yet to collect that from our most recent trial. It drops um, and uh, it's difficult to put numbers on it, um, but you'll see, I think in our TRD trial, I mean, the majority will show relapse out at, at six months, but that's exactly what you would expect with a, with a population with treatment resistant depression that have a life history of, of severe depression. Um, so that's you know, a major area for the future is around relapse prevention. Remember that this treatment model is just one or two therapy sessions. You compare that with you know, daily dosing with a conventional um, medication. So there's certainly scope for thinking about um, you might call you know, relapse prevention strategies and and also when you see relapse, then coming in with another treatment session. So optimizing the, the treatment model going forwards, there's major scope for that. Absolutely. 
A question here, despite the best efforts of double blinding participants, how do you account for the different side effect profiles leading people to getting an idea of what arm they're in? Yeah, the, the blindness is almost an impossible problem. You could try an active placebo. Uh, we didn't measure, and we should have, uh, the, uh, the guessing of condition in this trial. In SSRI trials, typically they don't ask as well, probably because they know that most patients can guess. If you go into the SSRI condition in an SSRI trial, there's some data that suggests that the guess accuracy is about 80%. And so there's a misnomer that these are trials that are effectively blinded, that they're not, you know. And so what does that mean? It means usually you know what condition you've gone into and then how does that affect how you report your symptom severity and such like. So absolutely, I get the limitation. It is a limitation, uh, quite how we address that going forward. But it's, it's a difficult question and we could try active placebos. We could also say, or maybe this gold standard measure, the double blind RCT is kind of fool's gold in, in a way. Is it really so, you know, true, you know, optimal model. And I think looking at other ways of assessing treatment, efficacy and safety through pragmatic trials has a lot of appeal as well. And obviously, well, we've got a lot of questions from people who um, are asking, you know, did for the people who were um, on the psilocybin side of the trial, how did you, did they have to tape, obviously they had to taper off their SSRIs if they were on them in the lead up, is that is that what happened? Yes, yeah, and that's another limitation. So it seems that if you're on an SSRI, the effects of a psychedelic are muted. Um, and so some tapering is required and that's difficult. And so managing that, which we had to do is a challenge. Um, and so that's one limitation going forwards. But I should say that that's one of the reasons why I was really keen to do a major depressive disorder trial and not do more TRD research because in yeah. TRD, everyone is on medication and then has yeah. to come off in MDD, you know, it can be your first episode. And, and there was a strong intuition that this should be an option earlier on in the course of a depressive disorder and you shouldn't have to wait to fail SSRIs and everything else uh, to, to have the option of psychedelic therapy. That's my view. It's just about opening options to patients really. Mm -hmm. um, question here, why is the therapy component variable, variable not used also with the SSRI? Has it oh, been? It oh, it is, okay. Yeah, yeah, no, that's important to emphasize. Yeah. So you, you yeah. may have inflated the efficacy of escitalopram by the, the good quality of psychological support that was provided in this trial. The, the counter argument is six weeks isn't long enough for an SSRI, but just think about that for a moment. You know, you have severe depression, maybe it's quite likely you're suicidal. And the message is you're gonna to have to wait a couple of months to see some response. It's not a great message, you know, so to be able to get, you know, positive Im improvements earlier on counts for a huge amount. And what sort of patients were excluded from your trial, like bipolar or other types of? Yeah, so any personal or family history of a diagnosed psychotic disorder, and we only looked at unipolar depression, so anyone with bipolar was excluded. Um, we also excluded anyone with a, a diagnosis of personality disorder. That seems to complicate the therapeutic model. I don't necessarily think it should be a red flag forever. It, it's just maybe a different therapeutic model, more, you know, the psychological support might be required, different dosage, different compounds. Um, but, it, but we do have a bit of evidence that um, borderline personality disorder is, is especially difficult to treat with psilocybin therapy. Of course, it's difficult to treat across the board, but outcomes are less reliably positive in, in BPD. Question here, can you elaborate on the modality of psychotherapy in the integration sessions following exposure? Any thoughts on the integration sessions influence on efficacy post psilocybin exposure? Yes, uh, so we, we sort of go with um, what we believe is the sort of the, the minimum amount of 
preparation and integration with one eye on, of course, this has to roll out and cost effectiveness comes in and such like. So beyond screening, we have what we call a prep visit, which in this trial, as in previous one, included actually an MRI scan. But then you, you go in to the treatment room with your guides and you talk about expectations and uh, navigating the experience and, you know, so that's about further rapport building, but that's it. And then you have the session the next day. Um, and then integration, which is like kind of debriefing and compassionate, attentive listening, open listening, non-judgmental listening occurs the next day after a treatment session. And also in this trial, it occurred at the, the three weeks beyond um, the second treatment session with a phone call or a video call at one week. So I think there's a lot of scope for sort of telemedicine coming in to improve cost effectiveness. But in terms of visits, it's sort of one, one two, two integration visits and really just one, if you count screening as well, two prep visits as well. Yeah. And did they stay, did they have to stay overnight after their psilocybin yeah. session? It helped that they could stay overnight and typically they did. We have accommodation adjacent to the clinical research facility and that works quite well. It, it, and sometimes they'll have a, you know, a support person and next of kin stay with them overnight. Um, about the, the therapeutic model, it, it's kind of at the moment, it needs to be better sort of um, manualized and, and published on. Um, for a long time, it was just material in books. I think that's starting to change and there's training, of course, uh, which is great, um, but it's sort of its own thing. And I, I do think that, that that needs to yeah get out more and, and people to, will need to become familiar with it. It's sort of a mishmash of uh, humanistic, psychodynamic uh, psychotherapy, and then some third wave components like mindfulness based and, and acceptance and commitment therapy overlaps well with the principles of psychedelic therapy, but maybe even, you know, sort of more kind of um, evidence, strongly evidence-based psychotherapies like CBT could be useful, I think, for post-treatment when people are in that, you know, still have a kind of subacute plasticity, some evidence for that now, um, to harness that to, to, you know, work on cognitive reappraisals and such like. A lot of questions here from researchers too about the announcement that I think we might have mentioned, Robin, the $15 million um, announcement by our federal government last week for psychedelic trials. And obviously there's going to be a lot more opportunities for researchers in this space to actually get some traction in Australia, which is, which is very exciting as well. Um, can you talk about the reaction of the mainstream medical establishment to the emerging evidence and Kuhn's scientific revolution theory? Yeah, <laughs> well, I mean, it's a paradigm shift um, for a few reasons. Um, you know, this is drug assisted psychotherapy. So it goes beyond the classic sort of dominant medical model that has been sort of pure pharmacotherapy you know, let's find a drug that's precise, has, you know, targets the right, um, you know, abnormal mechanisms and, 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 and the drug will do all the work. But I just think that's too simplistic and it's too, yeah, it, it hasn't worked well enough in psychiatry. And so now we have a different model that is a nice, I think, middle way between the two divides, classic divides of psychiatry, you know, psychological approaches and and pharmacological and this harnesses both and I think that speaks to its power and that's where the strong assumptions are that there's a synergy between the drug action window plasticity and then the therapeutic work mm. driving positive outcomes well um, it's always wonderful to seeing your rebus model because um Carl Friston has just joined our advisory panel as well and uh, and he's actually doing a webinar which I will mention to everyone before we go to the next question. On the 9th of June, the anarchic brain, a revolutionary understanding of how psychedelics alter your mind. So it's on the 9th of June, Paul Friston, put it in your diaries, everyone, it should be big. <laughs> I'll be tuning in. Yeah, yeah. he's a, um, and really guided my 
and thinking in in this space um yeah and i would say the mainstream reception has been very positive in the main and you know thought leaders in psychiatry in particular are very open because bottom line they want to see improvements in their discipline and yeah they want to treat patients better so they've been very warm i would say actually they've been much warmer to developments in psychedelic science than Cognitive neuroscientists have been a little bit slow, but, you know, that's changing as well. Fantastic. Well, you're doing such a great job with that. So lots more questions. Um, so a lot of people ask, could microdosing following therapy assist in maintaining remission for the medium to long term? Is that something that you or any of your fellow researchers have considered? Um, we're not doing anything active there. Uh, but it's a, a very reasonable hypothesis, uh, it just needs to be tested. It's difficult to test microdosing because really, you know, you want a protocol. Ideally, you would have a protocol where people could take the medication and go home, um, or they are in some kind of inpatient ward and they stay over, but that's really expensive and not really pragmatically feasible. So you, you'd be trying to get through an ethics committee that people can take a low dose of remember, you know, scheduled in the highest bracket of harm, maximum punishment, you know, be use and, and such like with psychedelics. Uh, and then they can take this home. You know, it's a challenging thing to imagine an ethics committee would pass. That's why it's been difficult to do research on microdosing. We tried a sort of inventive solution pioneered by um, a colleague of ours, Balash, uh, which invited people to be their own scientists in a way. And they followed this blinding randomization protocol with placebo capsules and some with microdoses in. And there actually we, we found that there wasn't a significant difference between uh, taking a placebo and uh, a microdose beyond the effect explained by the guess. So translating that, if you were taking placebo and thought it was a microdose, it was as effective as if you were actually taking a microdose and thought it was yeah. a microdose. So yeah. It spoke of a very large effect of uh, a placebo effect with microdosing in particular. And that's likely to be the case with macrodosing as well. Um, so, yeah. In the limitations of the Western scientific model for trials, how are you able to tease out the chemicals effect from the critical influence of set and setting, which is part of the more spiritual ceremonial aspect that are often used as complements to using these medicines? Yeah, I mean, the most sort of systematic way is to try and do a study where you control those variables. And so you would have one condition that's stripped of, of this, the enriched setting and one that has it all. And then you would do drug and placebo. And so that would be the formal way to do it. And, you know, we're putting our minds there, that's something that I plan to do in the future. It's challenging work, but I think it probably needs to be done to really cement the, uh, well, cement, test the strong assumption that it, there is a positive synergy between drug-induced plasticity and then an enriched therapeutic context. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's a question here, is trauma history a contraindication to psilocybin? I'd say no, I'm sure you'll say no, that we all carry trauma, and um, but just reading it out there. Yeah, you, you might want to adapt the model if, it depends if it expresses as post-traumatic stress disorder, and then you, you'd want to make a decision based on your protocol, whether you're going to include people with uh, PTSD, comorbidity, and a depression trial, for example. It depends if it's sort of the primary presentation and in our trial, if it was, then we wouldn't actually include, but that's not speaking to, you know, where this will go in the future. Yeah. And there are trials being designed to look at PTSD with psilocybin therapies. Yeah. Um, I would imagine that they'd be. No, no, I've seen some, some trials emerging that look to be looking at PTSD. Um, a question here, do SSRIs inhibit mystical experiences? Mm. yeah um spontaneously occurring or or <laughs> psychedelic induced i mean maybe both which would be an interesting thing to think about if they would inhibit spontaneously occurring mystical type experiences i imagine that if i was to you know place a bet yeah because they they blunt they blunt the sensations so the emotions yeah. 
They do, yeah. So, um, and thinking about the mechanisms and the pivotal mental states model and the work behind that, um, it would make sense that you would be less likely to have a spontaneous pivotal mental state, which mystical type experiences would fall, up, fall under that umbrella term, that umbrella construct of pivotal mental states. That's kind of the point of, of that model. It's sort of a basic model. You know, a lot of things could fall under that, yeah. that construct. And, and because SSRIs downregulate the 2A receptor, and if the 2A receptor is, is a key for these pivotal mental states, then you're going to be less likely to, to have them if you're on an SSRI, which would mean, you know, less likely to have transformative experiences, whether yeah. positive or negative. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, lots more questions. Um, how might DMT and other psychedelics alter in the way they could treat mental illness in comparison to psilocybin? And how do you see the field evolving over the next three to five years? Big question, that one. <laughs> DMT is coming in, I think, mostly motivated by cost effectiveness considerations. And can we have a shorter um, treatment model where we could see more than just one patient in one room in one day? And so I think that's driving things a bit there. Uh, there are trials underway that um, Imperial have some connection with. Um, and uh, it's an interesting space. I, I see the rationale and I hope it works and, and you get, you know, equivalent or close to it, efficacy and safety. There's this issue that I is a bit of a favorite of mine at the moment. It's a subtle one, but I think it could be an important one of uh, the term is spiritual bypassing and, and the notion of bypassing is sort of shortcutting, you know, what a bypass is, is you take the easy road yeah. and there's a little bit of a question in my mind whether the rapid acting psychedelics yeah. could some of the deep psychological work that's required, I think, for you yeah. know, positive outcome. Oh, that makes sense. Has there been any economic evaluations um, protocols carried out on, you know, psilocybin versus treatment as usual um, or any insight onto the cost effectiveness? And this is a really important question, I think, in terms of these treatments, because the potential cost effectiveness is enormous, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, so there, there are efforts. So there's nothing published on psilocybin yet. There's something published on MDMA. Mm -hmm. Elliot Marseille at UCSF has done some nice work there on MDMA for PTSD with MAPS. Uh, so those, you know, sums have been run, the maths have been run by uh certain you know psychedelic medicine developers uh and it, it has to be said it's expensive um because it's staff exhaustive the model at the moment or intensive um and so that's why i think some attention has turned to the rapid acting psychedelics but another thing to consider is you know how can we improve some of the costs through um you know, relapse prevention, any risk mitigation. Um, and, uh, you know, does psychedelic therapy have the potential to keep people well? And I think if that's factored in, things start to change a little bit. But the system has to be long-sighted enough to take that into consideration. And I think we will get there. It's just going to take a bit of time. And I hope we're not sort of jackknifed in the process. Um, by something that we haven't foreseen. But mm. I, I do believe that, you know, we can improve the cost effectiveness when we look at long-term improvements and patients achieving remission and that being sustained. And I do think that that's achievable. Mm. That's exciting. The 5-HT2A system you described as being activated by stressful life experiences leading to hyper plasticity psychedelics activate the system and the subsequent plasticity how does this hang on how does this mesh with the fact that blissful psychedelic experiences also facilitate positive change is this stress induced plasticity also triggered by naturally generated positive states well that's an interesting question isn't it remember that um if psychedelics are doing it the psychedelics doing it so it's it's not naturally occurring 
Mm. Um, but the question would be, can you have a spontaneously occurring pivotal mental state that is blissful, that's positive, that mm. um, triggers positive psychological transformation? And you just have to look at the phenomenology, forget about the neurochemistry for a moment and say, well, yes, uh, people have you know, conversion experiences and such like, and spontaneously occurring spiritual, mystical, religious experiences that pivot them towards you know, healthy lifestyle and sort of philosophical changes that stick, that yeah. look good, you know, and, and have them pivot towards you know, a life of, of relative wellness. Mm -hmm. So how can that happen? And I just think it, it can happen. While you can have a background of, in the same way that you can have post-traumatic um, growth, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily take the track of psychopathology. So there's this fundamental basic plasticity. And I guess typically the rule is bad stuff has happened that's led to this hyperplastic state. And because conditions are bad, you're going to carry on, you know, a, along a, a dark track. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, another part of the paradigm shift here is to say, when I see someone in a psychological crisis, I know to come in with the most supportive psychological context possible to try and pivot them towards wellness. You know, so don't charge in, you know, putting them in restraints and jabbing in a depot or whatever. I, I don't know, just it, it, that it's challenging, but it's it's interesting to ask that question, isn't it? Absolutely. Um, just um, you know. We've been having some challenges with the reaction of some of the medical professional associations, which I think we've we've spoken about, um, and some of which have opposed, you know, progress, I guess, towards psychedelic therapy in Oregon and Australia. Um, I'm just having a look. Has thought been given to identify potential patients not by DSM ICD diagnosis, but rather whether or not they are there are identifiable underlying psychological factors. So not using the traditional analysis yeah. tools. In a way that slide I had on the trans diagnostic space um, yeah. is about that. It, it's, you know, and there are things like the RDOC initiative that's more about finding this biologically um, biased there, but, you know, finding some key target that, over where there's overlap transdiagnostically and you know whether it's something like neuroticism or impulsivity or some shared space and so yeah i i tend to think it is this you know the the term borrowed from evolutionary science would be canalization you've gone down a particular track track and it's the opposite of plasticity in a sense everything is entrenching this way of being you know like in addiction there's just gets further and further, you know, deeper yeah. this Frenchman. Um, and I think that's common to a lot of psychiatric disorders, whether it's a negative cognitive bias in depression. And once you know a depression, it's more likely to fall into that, like a literal depression gets stuck in that rut. Um, and so, yes, absolutely. In, in a sense, you, whoever asked that question has intuited the way that we're trying to approach things here mm -hmm. and, and go beyond diagnostic categories that are useful for clinicians doing their work, but they don't, they haven't really emerged from the science. Yeah, yeah. Um, in your trial, with, did any of the participants have a bad trip and did that affect their outcome? <laughs> Maybe in a good way, right? <laughs> well, challenging experiences that have this, there, there's a subtlety there, uh, and it's partly why we developed this scale called emotional breakthrough inventory. So, you know, the key question is, was it all challenge? Was it all a bad trip? You know, a bit of a simplistic term, but yeah. way to talk about it, was it all dysphoric and difficult and struggle? And then the trip ended and yeah. And if that happens, there's a bit of naturalistic evidence that it's obviously associated, I say obviously, but it's associated with less positive outcomes. However, if you have an intense challenging experience, but experience a breakthrough, then you do very well. So it, it very much depends on whether, um, and a guide, you know, a talented, skillful guide can help here to shepherd, shepherd a 
patient participant individual towards breakthrough you know and, mm. and that's part of the skill um yeah and and perhaps why one shot at goal is a bit too good to be true you know and, and why in our more recent trial we have two shots on goal two treatment yeah. sessions with yeah. and uh you know going forward who who knows what the the sort of golden number is the optimal yeah. number um and just on that, um, there's a question here. Is there a theory behind why psychedelics require less frequent therapy than traditional antidepressants? Is it the relaxing and revision of the brain and its modality? And if so, is it then more relatable to cognitive behavioural therapy or other forms of therapy compared to SSRIs? Well, I think it comes down to the nature of the plasticity, that it's this you know, very intense but short-lived um, uh, period of hyperplasticity, somewhat short-lived. There's actually some preprint data um, available now on markers of anatomical plasticity with psilocybin that go out to 30 days, and that's longer than you see with ketamine, mm -hmm. for example. It helps explain, I think, somewhat this intuition that we have that there's some subacute, extended subacute plasticity that you get with classic psychedelics. Yeah. Uh, I think there's scope for looking at a range of different psychotherapies and maybe there's a common denominator as there's some evidence to suggest for psychotherapy, you know, around things like the strength of the therapeutic alliance that sort of suggests that the flavor of it, while it, yeah, sure, it will have some influence. Um, the most important factor is whether you uh, are compliant and, and want to get better. Um, you know, in this alliance with your, your therapist. Question here, were the participants of the study screen for previous non-clinical use of psychedelics? Sorry, Tanya, would you repeat that one? Sorry, were the participants of the study screen for previous non-clinical use of psychedelics? Yes, they couldn't have taken a psychedelic for therapeutic purposes. Yeah. And some had taken psilocybin about 30%, I think, had taken psilocybin at some point in their life, but often it was like, you know, decades before. It's quite a senior, quite a mature sample. Um, so we considered that um, okay. And, and also, you know, with one eye on rollout, it, it's a more realistic sample than having everyone entirely naive. We have done that kind of work, and you do get outcome we've, we've done it in healthy volunteers entirely naive first time uh, use of 25 milligrams in a supportive context very very positive um, yeah. mental health improvements in well-being and such like yeah. so and actually there wasn't a relationship between those who'd had past use of psilocybin and the outcome so it didn't seem to drive a bias interesting um, are you fearful of anything happening in the future that would derail the amazing uh, momentum of current psychedelic research? What can people on this call and in the research community and the general public do to avoid this? <laughs> Gosh, let's hope there's not a fire downstairs. Uh, let me just... <laughs> is, that, is that derailing the amazing momentum? <laughs> Hang on one sec. He'll be back in a moment. You're not de derailing the amazing momentum, are you, Robin? <laughs> that was uncanny timing there. Of course, <laughs> worried, you know, but you don't want to be too worried about something that's not there yet. But I think things like excessive, uh, how does Michael Pollan put it? Something exuberance, is it excessive or anyway, just being you know, getting too carried away. I often have to check myself here as, you know, we're looking at great data, not to get too carried away and to remain, you know, a good uh, scientist, a good critical acumen. I, I think that will very much serve the health and the sustainability of the trajectory that we're on. Also, I hope that the money that's flooding in doesn't corrupt things. There's a lot of interest and questions about that at the moment. So, uh, Again, if we can stay true to saying things as we see them, at least personally as a scientist, um, thankfully we came along, did the science before the money started pouring in. So the conflict of, is a bit different because we are sort of- yeah. On the way, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, 
So I actually, I actually probably worry a bit more about those forces than the pushback because um, the pushback, well, as things presently stand, uh, it has very weak foundations, any real significant pushback. It doesn't come from good, compelling science. It comes from, you know, fears and uh, and biases from the other mm. end of the spectrum. Yeah. So, um, but it, yeah, so we'll keep our eyes open for any um, unforeseen adverse events, but uh, I haven't seen any that that I think are going to derail things. No, and I think if all of us just work together collectively for ethical good, um, that will make a huge difference. Yeah, and, and again, to be very, you know, I, you get so it's a cultural thing in the sense to, to science and the nature of that, uh, the way we do things, you know, and I, th I do think there's huge value in it um and uh, if we so if we can stay you know true to the scientific method of testing and and critical thinking then it's going to serve the longevity of of the space i think okay um last question before we have a, a couple of wrap-up questions what is the actual likelihood that taking antidepressants uh has serious oh sorry that um that psych taking psychedelics has serious adverse side effects like antidepressants do, for example, severe serotonin syndrome. Have such adverse effects been seen empirically or are they only theoretically postulated at this point? Um, this is important because we are potentially barring some of the people who most need the benefits of psychedelics because some people are afraid that they're gonna get psychosis or you know, other things that are not proven in the science. Yeah. I mean, of course, we look at these things and uh, um, we don't see any cases. We haven't seen any cases in the controlled research. Mm -hmm. My knowledge, there haven't been any cases in, in the research done by other teams in this space. No serious adverse events in, it must be a, a few th couple thousand at least, I mm -hmm. think, patient participants administered psilocybin in the last 15 years or so. Um, and, uh, and like I said, you know, we even drilled down uh, into, into asking specifically about any of this. Mm. Uh, yes, and when your, when your study comes out in a couple of weeks, sorry to interrupt, um, you'll have some detail, further details on the, the lower nature of any type of side effects. Yeah, so you'll be able yeah. to see that. And, um, and I, of course, you know, something like triggering a psychotic disorder, while very rare, if it happens, it's, it's a serious adverse event. Um, and so we are making efforts in our naturalistic data uh, um, to look at, we, you know, we call that the sort of bottom margin analysis, the rare cases of people's mental health outcomes getting worse, mm -hmm. and what's behind that. And we have found that those with a history of of um, bipolar, um, borderline personality disorder, they were four times more likely to fall into that bottom margin. Bipolar and a history of any psychotic disorder, again, more likely. Mm -hmm. So See, there's, there's so many questions here that are asking about the borderline, the schizophrenia and the bipolar. Um, and I mean, we, we've seen quite a lot of hope from researchers like yourselves that in time there will be more studies across some of those very difficult to treat conditions? Well, it's when there's great need and, you know, there's nothing really for, for personality disorder and, you know, and then the major side effects that you have with mood stabilizers. And so while the risk is upped, you know, the potential to-, to um, Heal people. To, yeah, so you have to, you always have to weigh up the ratio of harm to benefit and and so there are some trials being done it's risky work but it, it's i'm glad that it's happening i'm glad that people are asking that question those questions and and uh, and they're doing it in a mature way and there are you know perspective pieces on how we could think about treat treating borderline personality disorder with psychedelics and so they're very well thought through and, and no one's shying away from the problem and the challenge 
um, uh, but um, yeah, it's just, um, it does up the risk. And I suppose what's happened is that the field has tried to go into those spaces where it's arguably somewhat easier um, uh, to make inroads. Um, and, and so that's another point to, you know, not opening this up too broadly too quickly because um, we're just finding our feet at the, at the moment and, you know, the research needs to be done at the right pace. It, and yeah. it is happening. But well, I mean, microdosing is a good example here because that got way ahead of the evidence. You know, there was all these media articles and all this excitement and fuss and very little science. It got way ahead of the evidence. Thankfully, that hasn't happened with macrodosing psychedelic therapy, but, you know, let's keep it that way if, if we can, I think is important. No, absolutely. And, and um, final question, just before we have um, a final wrap up and a couple of other questions is, do you see um, a good potential for group therapy? Obviously that would reduce costs and could provide some very interesting outcomes for, for certain types of patients as well. Sorry, Tanya, I missed. Mr. Do you see any potential for group therapy um, as also for, not only for cost savings, but for potential enhanced outcomes for certain groups and patients? Yeah. Well, I do. We've got yeah. a paper on this phenomenon called communitas, which is like a sense of shared humanity um, and togetherness that you see in, in group psychedelic therapy retreats. And it seems to be a strong moderator or mediator of positive therapeutic outcomes and that's coming out soon so you'll see communitas in the title i think there might be a preprint available already so absolutely and and i think the group work during prep and particularly integration could be really useful for um yeah trying to sustain positive outcomes and also help ground people if if well sort of moderated yeah and obviously you're a supporter of the therapist taking the medicine together with um, you know, um, learning how it works, like therapists actually doing healthy patient trials and, and that sort of thing. I think it's an advantage. Yeah. Whether it, we should make it obligatory, I'm, I'm not sure. Um, I do yeah. think it, it does provide an advantage if you've had personal experience. Okay, terrific. We'll just um, put on a couple of final slides and then we'll ask you one last concluding question. Elan, if you could pop the slides on, thank you. So, Ladies and gentlemen, this is our psychological support service. So if you are using the medicines, not that we advocate that you do use them outside clinical environments, but if you are and need integration support, then please um, contact our psychological support service, which is excellent and all around Australia. Next slide, thank you. Full screen, please, if you can. And um, this is Tim Ferriss's wonderful quote. So he says he views the next five years as an absolutely golden window using relatively small amounts of money, which can be philanthropic or as an investor to really affect millions of lives. Like how often do any of us get the chance to really help potentially millions of people and people who are very close to us, our brothers and sisters, our parents, our children. So next slide, thank you. So we urge each of you to help in every way you can share this webinar, start conversations, join your chapters, uh, start new chapters. If you wanna start a new chapter, please contact us. We have a wonderful learn section with the journal articles. And of course, as soon as Robin's journal article comes out, we'll have it in um, big neon lights and share it widely. Talk to your doctors and medical professionals and just make sure that they really understand the data and the science and encourage them to join these webinars. Every webinar bring two more people and you never know how many people um, we can effectively educate and inform about these medicines. And please help us, we're philanthropists, but we can't do this alone. And small and large donations make an enormous difference to a mission of this kind. Talk to your local MPs. Very, very important that they hear from you as constituents and understand the urgency of making sure that these medicines can be available to those who are really suffering, especially at the moment through the special access scheme pathways. And please attend our events um, and our big summit in November. We'll show you who's speaking at that in one second. Next slide. We also have Australia's first book of psychedelic healing stories. 
Submissions to this close at the end of April. And so if you've got a story of healing through psychedelic medicines, we really welcome your story. There's already over 30 stories that have been submitted. They're absolutely moving. And um, we really welcome you. And we're gonna send it, Robin, I'm just giving you a heads up. We, we'd love an endorsement from you when we, when we um, finish this book. So I'm gonna reach out to you about <laughs> And a few of the other wonderful researchers around the world. This is our CPAC course, our Certificate in Psychedelic Assisted Therapies. Our second intake starts in July. There's only a few places left for that. Intakes three and four, and potentially five and six in 2022. Um, a number of those places are also filling for 2022. So if you want to register for this, don't miss out and apply as soon as you can. Next slide. And this is who's coming to the summit in November, an incredibly exciting lineup of world leaders in this space. And we really encourage you to register now. We've sold over 350 tickets, I think, and starting to really sell a lot more tickets now that um, our lockdowns and, and some of the other restrictions have ended. So we really encourage you to book your tickets. It's preceded by a two day introductory workshop in psychedelic assisted therapies for those who are interested in a career in this space. Next slide, thank you. Finally, upcoming events. So actually on the 7th of April, there's an information session about the CPAC course. Uh, 28th of April, Dr. Gabby Agin Libes on psilocybin assisted therapy for end of life stress. Uh, 12th of May, 10 years on the future of psychedelics. Well beyond mental health with Ronan Levy and Michael Kidd from Field Trip in Canada. And then of course, we have this very exciting one on the 9th of June with Professor, uh, Professor and Dr. Carl Friston. And we'll take that screen sharing off now. Thank you. And um, pop it back on all of the wonderful gallery. Thank you for those who stayed the course. We know there's lots more questions and we're sorry that we couldn't answer all of them. But Robin, wow, how generous you've been with your time, your knowledge, and, um, and just with your heart in terms of sharing your incredible wisdom and expertise with our community and community really all over the world that is tuned in tonight. And um, just brilliant. And we look forward to sharing this webinar. And we very much look forward to your final um, uh, report Report coming out. What day is that coming out in the New England Journal, Robin? The 15th of April. We don't know for certain, but that's what they're working towards. We're all okay. working. Thank you. And um, if you have one wish before you go, what is your one wish before you go? We had David Nutt recently and he said, and this won't apply to you, but he said, um, I know that he's been a great mentor to you. He said he wishes that he will be alive to see these medicines being regularly um, prescribed and available to patients. But what's your wish, Robin? Gosh, oh, that's hard. Um, yeah, the, 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 this does open up and that the, the promise and the hope that I can see in our data translates into uh, real world hope for for, um, for the general public um, and you know for too long we've thought that um, mental illness is, is yeah almost untreatable um, and and that compounds of course the uh, the, the the nature of things when there's a lack of hope so to bring this message of, of hope from the evidence is wonderfully uh, you know, rewarding on, on many levels. I, w I just want to see that, you know, translate over into the real world. Oh, thank you. That's such a wonderful, wonderful and important uh, wish. And uh, we will all do everything we can to support you in this mission. And we can't wait to see you in Australia um, very soon. <laughs> well, in a few months, in a few months, in a few months. <laughs> Mind you, a few months will come along very soon. So. <laughs> Thank, Thank you. you a Thanks, huge Beth. round of applause for, uh, for Robin. You're a legend, Robin. Thank you so much. Namaste, everyone. Have a great evening. And please do bring at least two people to our next um, webinars. Keep raising the vibration of this movement and educating everyone we can. Thank you.